Welcome back to this series, Digging Into John's Gospel. If you haven't yet seen the first two videos in chapter one of John, I encourage you to go back and look at those. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, then hit subscribe, like this video, share it with others. What we're going to be seeing in chapter two is Jesus' glory revealed. As always, I encourage you to take some time to read through this passage yourself, just to familiarize yourself, yourself with the story and spend a bit of time praying. Um, ask God to open your eyes to see wonderful things about Jesus, that the evidence about Jesus might grow your belief in Jesus, which indeed leads to life through Jesus. Some helpful context for this section. It's chapter 1, verse 14 where we are told that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory. Glory is a key theme here. And then also the context of 1 verse 50, where Jesus is talking to Nathanael and He says to him, You will see greater things. This chapter shows us the first of those greater things that Jesus will do. John helpfully sets the scene for us. He tells us that we are in Cana of Galilee. And it's worth noting that that Cana of Galilee is mentioned again in chapter 4, verse 46. Kind of book ends on a section. And what we see in this section, from chapter 2 to the end of chapter 4 and into chapter 5, is Jesus is bringing in something new. The new is replacing the old. Jesus is the key character to note in this section. So, it's often worth just going through and highlight all the sections where we're told that Jesus is doing or saying specific things. Another set of characters worth highlighting are his disciples and then the Jews. So the disciples are those who we'll see respond rightly to Jesus and the Jews generally in John's Gospel respond negatively to Jesus. Remember too that in John we've got evidence, belief and life which are key themes that we can trace right through this whole this whole story and again the evidence starts to build in this section evidence which is calling us to believe in Jesus which we'll also see and that belief in Jesus leads to life through his name as the key verses in John tell us John 20 verse 30 to 31 so we're told here that what Jesus did here in Canaan was the first of his signs through which he revealed his glory and this idea of signs uh, we're going to see a whole number of signs through the Gospel and all these signs attest to Jesus' identity as the Messiah, as the Son of God and they are meant to lead us to faith. So this is the first sign uh, but we also hear the disciples remembering things and the Jews ask for a sign and the evidence mounts as Jesus answers and as Jesus the things that Jesus speaks, the disciples recall those details. And all of this is evidence, the things they saw, the things they heard. And then they give their, the testimony that we receive. So, signs is a key theme in the book of John. And in this section, we are given the first sign through which he revealed his glory. So we were told in chapter 1, verse 14, John said, We have seen his glory. And Jesus here reveals that glory and that key theme of belief, and his disciples believed in him. We were told at the end that they believed the scriptures, and the crowds believed in his name. Just another important theme to look out for in John's Gospel is the idea of the hour. And here Jesus says to his mother when she asks him to help that his, his hour has not yet come. The hour in John is, is referring to the hour of his death, 
the greatest sign by which he reveals his glory and shows that he can do what no one else can do. And that's what we see in this section. He can do what no one else can do. So if you want to cross-reference uh, the hour in John, you go 7 verse 30, 8 verse 20, 13 at the beginning of the Upper Room Discourse, verse 1, and then in Jesus' Prayer, 17 verse 1. Speaking about from verse thir uh, chapter 13 onwards, Jesus saying, okay, now my, my hour has come. He knew that his death was approaching. And if even from chapter 2 in John, the clock is ticking down to that key event in Jesus' life. And this amazing sign that Jesus does in these first few verses, or in these first section, is that he turns the water into wine. The water had been turned into wine. Now, we can miss the amazingness of what's actually happening here because we're familiar with the story. But... It is an absolutely astounding thing that Jesus does here. There's 20 to 30 gallons, so in our terms it's 75 to 115 litres each. They, it's 800 odd bottles of wine. So it is a, an astounding amount of wine and it is the best till now that he says here. So it's the best wine that, that this guy has tasted. And this is a creation miracle, and that's something else worth looking out for in John's Gospel. Jesus, the signs that we see are creation signs, as when he multiplies the bread, or as he walks on water, or he gives the blind man his sight. It was a man who was born blind, so a creation miracle needed to happen. But we were told in chapter 1 that all things were made through Jesus. So this creation sign is just pointing that Jesus can do what only God can do because he is God. So as you work through this perhaps familiar story, take the time to, to see the wonder because John tells us that Jesus reveals his glory through the sign, but signs by their very nature point beyond themselves. And so does this one. The water into wine isn't the main event here, essentially. It's pointing to Jesus as this one who can do what no one else can do. Nobody else at this party, no one else in history could do what Jesus does, turning this water into wine. And he is showing that something new and amazing is happening here. And a great chapter to go and read is Jeremiah 31, where we see Jeremiah prophesies about the new, the new covenant ultimately that would come in and replace the old covenant. And in that section, we, we see Jeremiah speaking about a new wine and joy and gladness and alluding to the new that's breaking in. But then he gets to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, where we see the new covenant coming in, God's word being written on our hearts and in our minds, and we've been called God's people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. So Jesus changing the water into wine is showing that something amazing and new is happening here. And that transitioning into the second half of the story uh, actually shows us why these fit together. Jesus reveals his glory here, and then we see that glory return to the temple. The word for temple used in these opening verses is a different word to the word used in Jesus words here and their reply here uh, this Greek word ahiros is kind of the whole temple complex where the word temple used here is naos which is more the, the inner sanctuary um, and that's where the, the vital sacrifices within the temple were done, the place where the sacrifice for sin was made. And what we see here, as Jesus drives out the, the animals and turns over the money, changes, changes tables, he's coming in and saying, he's showing that this temple and all that it represented 
was not achieving what it wasn't changing the hearts of the people uh, it was the way that God had set up for his people to deal with their sin but they had to keep coming back and sacrifice over and over again where Jesus is showing he's driving out the animals and saying soon there's not going to be a need for these sacrifices and he shows us that he himself is going to replace this temple he's going to do what no temple sacrifice could ever achieve. Only Jesus and the sacrifice that he will make at the end of John's Gospel is what can make a people right before God. So this sign of the new wine was just pointing to the big new thing that Jesus was going to do in fixing our relationship with God. And the Jews, the enemies of Jesus, come in. We see in John's Gospel, sadly, they reject Jesus. They don't believe in him. And they ask for a sign. Jesus has just given them a sign. He's given them a sign, driving out the, the people, treating the temple as a market. But they want something else. So Jesus says, well, destroy this place and I'll raise it again in three days. Now, that would have boggled their brains. How on earth can Jesus do that? But John explains it in verse 21, as John helpfully does a lot of times in his gospel. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Jesus is speaking here about his body being destroyed on the cross and then being raised in three days again. And so after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. They remembered the evidence they believed that evidence that was all about Jesus and they received the life that comes through Jesus. And this big story is showing us that Jesus' glory is revealed in that he came to do what no one else can do. He came to turn this water into wine as a sign that the new covenant was breaking in. He came to clear the temple to show that this temple was not going to be the place where sins would be dealt with for very much longer. He was going to be destroyed. A sacrifice was going to be made that would be a once and for all, never to be repeated sacrifice. And that's why Hebrews 7 and Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, often speak about Jesus' once and for all sacrifice. The, the need to buy sheep and cattle and doves for sacrifices would soon be gone because Jesus came to sacrifice in a way that would replace all other sacrifices in the future. And in this section we do see two responses to Jesus. We see the Jews rejecting him and the call of this gospel is to say don't reject Jesus, believe in him. And we see that his disciples saw the signs, they knew that it revealed his glory, they believed in him. And the call of this section is to believe in him too. And Jesus' glory continues to be seen today as more and more people do believe in him. We should rejoice in the fact that we know Jesus, that he has made us new creations. And as his glory is revealed in our salvation, we should be praying that many others would keep seeing God's glory on display, Jesus' glory on display as they read his word but also as they see the transformation that has happened in us as Jesus does in us what no one else could do he gives us new hearts he makes us live lives for his glory and so as you teach this stand amazed at who Jesus is and what he's done and encourage those who you're teaching to believe this evidence that they too might have life and let's be praying that many others would look at this evidence and also come to trust in Jesus. Well, God bless as you dig in further.